welcome to February or welcome to January 31st, but welcome to February and to the fun intervention. Thank you for trusting me with this adventure. And I wanted to start by just explaining a bit about what I mean by fun intervention and talking about why it's actually important for us to do this right now. Because a lot of people push back reflexively, A, on the idea of fun, and B, on the idea of a fun intervention. Clearly, you guys are a little bit more evolved than that because you're in this call and you signed up for the fun intervention. But I think that it's good to set that out to start with. So first of all, by fun intervention, I'm talking about an opportunity for us to spend the next four weeks this month prioritizing fun giving ourselves the gift of actually focusing on things that bring us joy, which is very important. It's something that we need in normal times. And I would argue that we need more than ever now, both because of February and because of everything else going on right now that's adding to our normal seasonal stress. I think one of the main things people tend to get wrong about fun when they think about fun is that they assume that it's frivolous. And they think, okay, fun. Yeah, that's nice when I have it. But honestly, I don't have time. I have too many res responsibilities for that. It's something that kids get to have, but I'm an adult. I'm a serious grown up. I just do not get to do that. But one of the interesting things I found in my research as I was writing my book and researching it and trying to live the ideas myself is that that's totally wrong. <laughs> fun is not frivolous at all. The more fun we have in our everyday lives, the better we'll be able to cope with the tough stuff that life throws our way, the more resilient we'll be. There's actually something called the broaden and build hypothesis or theory of positive emotions by this woman named Barbara Fredrickson. Um, and it posits that positive experiences aren't just the results of you already doing well, they actually empower you to have more resilience for future stressful events. So I hope that helps you kind of turn fun on its head a bit. We tend to think of fun as something that we only get to have when we're already doing well, but it actually can help us do well. In other words, it's not the results of human flourishing. It actually is a cause of human flourishing. So my hope for you is that throughout this month, not only will you enjoy the process of actually getting to prioritize fun, but you'll have the same experience that I've had as a result of this project, which is that you'll start to feel that your own spirits feel a little bit lighter and you'll feel a little bit better able to cope with all, whatever it is that you've got going on right now, because we all have our individual challenges. So that's a really good thing. The other thing that people don't recognize about fun is that it actually is very good for us, physically and emotionally and mentally. It feels good, but it also does good things for our bodies. It actually makes us feel more connected to other human beings, which is ex actually extremely important for physical health. And it reduces our stress levels. And anything that reduces our stress is actually going to be good for our physical health as well. So I came to conclude as I was researching the book that in a very interesting way, you actually could consider fun to be a health intervention, which is something I had never thought about. And I don't think many other people have either. So someone is asking you, how can you possibly be thinking about fun right now, considering all the stuff going on? I hope that you have a couple of good answers and that you'll be able to invite them to join the fun intervention, which as a side note, people can still do even after the official start of this um, challenge. So I wanna talk about what fun actually is. I didn't make slides for this conversation, guys. I went really old school and I wrote things on paper in a marker. So you're gonna to have to suffer through my, uh, my attempts to have written this down on paper. And as a side note, if you do have questions, if you can drop them into the Q&A, that would be great. I'm gonna save some time at the end for questions, but we'll do it that way. So what is fun anyway? It seems like this should be an easy question to answer because we use the word fun all the time, but it's actually much harder than you might think. And to explain, how I came to my own definition of fun, I wanna tell you a bit about how this book came to be to begin with. So the power of fun is really a direct follow-up to how to break up with your phone. And the reason is that once I'd broken up with my phone, which by the way, just means creating better boundaries with your devices, it doesn't mean dumping them entirely. I was left with this entirely new challenge that perhaps some of you have encountered yourselves, which is once you spend less time on one thing, you end up with more free time. So I had reclaimed a lot of the time I'd spend on my phone, 
but I hadn't yet asked myself what I wanted to do with that time. So I had this moment when I was sitting on my couch and my husband and I were in the midst of taking a full 24 hour break from our devices, which is practice that I actually encourage you guys to experiment with as well. It's a great way actually to make space for fun. But in this case, my daughter was napping. He was out doing errands or something. I had this like glorious moment, glorious hour ahead of me where I could do whatever I wanted to. It should have been just so amazing to have this space in early parenthood. And instead, I totally freaked out. And the reason I freaked out is exactly what I was just saying. I realized without my phone to distract me, I had lost sight of what I wanted to do with my own time. And that was really upsetting because as I, I think is probably true for many people out there watching this, I like to think that I had interests. I like to think that I was an engaged person who was capable of enjoying her own life. But instead I was just sitting on the couch waiting for dinner, which I immediately concluded I meant I was really just waiting to die. That is actually where my mind went. So I freaked out and I decided to ask a question to myself that I had asked people when I was researching how to break up with your phone and that I encourage you to ask yourselves right now. And in fact, if you want, feel free to drop your answer to this in the chat, which is what is something I always say I want to do, but I supposedly don't have time for. And the idea was that I actually probably did have some time. I just had been wasting it on my phone. So my answer to this question was that I wanted to learn to play the guitar. I had a guitar and I didn't, I just had never gotten around to learning to play it. So I signed up for this class, this adult class at what was actually a children's music studio, started going to the class. And it was so interesting because the time in this class just flew by. I was with a bunch of other adults. They were interested in learning the guitar, but it was BYOB, it was very laid back. And we just basically played together. I mean, obviously we played the guitar, but we were just playing together. Like there was no purpose is what I'm saying. And I just felt this kind of buoyant energy every time I went to the class, time seemed to fly by. And it soon became this highlight of my week. I felt myself feeling energized, not just during the class, but throughout the week as well, I felt more resilient. I felt just happier. And I became really interested in trying to figure out what this feeling was that I was getting in the class. And I was racking my brain, obviously I'm a writer, so I like words. And I was like, what's the word that describes this? And I eventually came to conclude the word that describes this best is fun. Like that's what's happening. I'm having fun. Now I should say like, I'm not a miserable person. I'm a pretty happy person. I love my life, but it was still something that felt kind of, I don't know. It was like, I, I discovered this thirst that I didn't realize I had. And the more I experienced this, this feeling that called fun, the more I wanted it. And the more interested I became in understanding what fun actually was so that I could have more of it for myself. So that is how I got started and what became how to, sorry, what became the power of fun. And what I quickly realized is that the dictionary definition of fun, by the way, I don't know why my background just got blurred. I don't know what just happened there, but here we are. Anyway, what I quickly realized is that the definition of fun that's in the dictionary does not match up with what the definition of fun was that I was feeling when I was in this class. The definition of fun in a dictionary is lighthearted pleasure or amusement. I was feeling something much more powerful. And I had an idea of how I would define it based on my own background as a science journalist and my background um, writing about things like positive psychology and mindfulness. But I wanted to check because I have a real concern that just like, I was like, maybe I'm just overreacting. You know, maybe this is just Catherine's experience of having fun and everyone else is like, it is just lighthearted pleasure. You're just fun starved. So I recruited a group of people and some of you might actually be out there in this audience today. And I asked people to share with me three experiences from their own lives that they would describe as having been so fun. That was my highly scientific term for it, so fun. And I did this, it's worth noting, in the summer of 2020. So this was in the midst of the initial lockdowns of the pandemic. And I was actually a little bit curious to see what people would even share, considering it was kind of a not very fun time. And as people's answers started pouring in and I read through them, I was really interested and heartened to realize that the energy that people that came across when I was reading these stories was the same that, that I was feeling. The experiences themselves were all different, but as I read through them, again, similar to what you just did with the delights in the chat, when I read through them one after another after another, I felt very joyful, 
but I also almost felt teary. It was a really profound experience. And that happens consistently if I look at this list of stories because the details were all different, but it was the same feeling. And so after I had read all these anecdotes, and in fact, in the survey, after I asked people to share them, I then proposed my definition. And I asked people at that point to say, okay, now that you've told me your stories, and actually I asked people to propose their own definition, does what I came up with accurately describe what you just told me? And the vast majority of people said yes. And this is how I came to my definition, which is, are you ready for the next slide, guys? This. The true fun, what I call true fun, is the confluence of three states, and that is playfulness, connection, and flow. Playful, connected flow. That's my definition of what true fun actually is. So just to clarify what I mean by those things, playfulness. Now, grown-ups often freak out about playfulness because they think you mean, oh, I have to play a game or I have to for me, I'm always like charades. You want me to play charades? Like every, I clench up, like there's a, doesn't sound fun. So I like to really um, emphasize that it's not about any particular type of play. It's just the attitude you bring to an activity. It's a spirit of lightheartedness and not caring too much about the outcome. That's what I mean when I say play. And it's also about letting go of perfectionism, which is something that's really foreign to many of us as adults. We're just used to having to put on a facade and put our quote best selves forward, but often that loses sight of who we are authentic authentically or who we are in that moment. So playfulness is letting go of that and it's very freeing. Connection is interesting. I noticed in all of my experiences and also those that were shared with me, there was some element of connection in them. Sometimes that element of connection was with the activity at hand. Sometimes it was, it was between someone's brain and their physical body. Sometimes it was the very, well, actually, I would say nearly universal sense that when people are having fun, they're connected with their authentic selves, which goes back to the reason it feels so good and so freeing. But interestingly, in the vast majority of instances, there was another living creature involved, normally a person, sometimes a dog or a cat, but there was something else alive. And that was true for introverts as well as extroverts, which I found to be very interesting. So there's an element of connection to these moments of true fun. And lastly, flow, oh dear, blurry. Christy, I don't know if you're able to change this, but I didn't mean to have my background blurred. Look at this, look at that, how interesting. Anyway, um, flow. Flow is a word used by psychologists to refer to the state of being so engrossed in your present experience that you lose track of time. So the most quintessential example would be an athlete in the midst of a game, someone playing a piece of music, but we've all experienced flow. It's when you're totally engaged and you're just really present with what you're doing. It could be doing a project, a project like a craft project or a work project or really anything where you're just completely in it, in the zone is often a term people use, or in the midst of a conversation that's particularly engaging or enjoyable or stimulating, flow. And the important thing to know about flow is that it can't happen if you're distracted, which we'll get to more in a little bit. Now, it's also important to note that flow is not the same thing as what's known as junk flow. And junk flow is when you kind of have your eyes glazed over and you lose track of time, but it's not because you're actually engaged. That's basically when you sit down to watch a couple episodes of your favorite show, but then thanks to the autoplay feature, you look up and all of a sudden four hours have passed and you're way past the point of enjoyment, right? Like that kind of glazed over hypnosis is junk flow. That's not what we're talking about. Real flow is a really active and engaged state. So true fun really does seem to be the confluence of these things. And the way to tell if you're having true fun, it's pretty simple. It's if you feel joyfully alive. That was the best way I could describe it is that when people mention these moments of true fun, it was when they felt joyfully alive. So that brings us to the question, or at least me to the question of what is not fun, because there's an issue I've found with fun because we don't have a good definition of it. We use it really casually, almost sloppily. I mean, it's not our fault. There's just not a good definition. Most of us have never thought about it, but that leaves us really vulnerable to anybody who wants to tell us that their product or their activity or service is fun because we're not really going to question it very much. But many of the many of the time or much of the time those activities don't actually result in playful connected flow and so if we did think about them we'd realize they're not fun at all i have a term for that fake fun oh okay this is like you know what this is like what it looks like when i don't have my glasses on because i'm extremely nearsighted i'm basically blind anyway fake fun 
bad. Fake fun's bad. Fake fun is my term for any activity or service or product that's marketed to us as fun, but that in reality does not result in playful connected flow. And the most notorious source of fake fun for many of us, social media <laughs> and some of the other stuff that we do on our phones when we're mindlessly scrolling. I don't have anything against a lot of these things per se, but I think if we actually were to take the time to think about it, we might realize that, oh, I turned to social media because I wanted a distraction or I wanted to have some kind of like pick me up. Maybe it gives you that for a moment or two, but it's not actual playful connected flow. It's different. And it often eventually results in you feeling gross because often the sources of fake fun in our lives are deliberately designed to get us to binge on them and to use them compulsively. And then they end up being the same as junk food where they taste really good for a second, but you end up eating too much and then you just feel disgusting. <laughs> so one of our goals is to try to reduce fake fun. And that will in turn enable us to use better, make better use of our time. So the better able you are, in other words, to distinguish fake fun from true fun, the easier it will be to make better choices about how to spend your limited leisure time. I should also say there are some things that are sources of fake fun in our lives that aren't social media and aren't big companies trying to manipulate us. It's just stuff that we kind of at some point categorized as fun, but really no longer is fun for us. Like you might have certain friends that if you actually think about how you feel when you're with them, you're like, actually, I don't have fun. I actually kind of feel stressed and depressed when I talk to them. Or you might have an activity you used to love, but it doesn't actually bring you the same feelings it used to. So there could be different sources of fake fun, but the better you are at identifying it, the easier it will be to clear more space for true fun. So, all right. So how do we do that though? So in my book, the first half, as you may know, in The Power of Fun is basically what I'm talking about now. What is fun? Why is it good for us? And what's been standing in our way? But I realized that while I do believe the definition of true fun is universal in the sense that it's playful connected flow, each of us finds that in different ways. Also, great, it's playful connected flow. Like, what are you supposed to do with that? <laughs> I really wanted to try to make the ideas in the book as tangible and concrete as possible. So it didn't end up making you feel like, oh no, I'm not having real fun. I'm not having true fun, but I don't know what the heck to do about it. Thanks a lot, Catherine. And then you'd shut the book and like throw it into a bonfire or something. I didn't want that to happen. I really wanted to help people. So I wanted to help people transform that playful connected flow from the nebulous concept into something under our control. To do that, I created a framework that I call Spark. Let me pick up my next slide. And Spark is as follows. It's short for making space for fun, pursuing passions, attracting fun, whoa, rebelling, and keeping at it. And over the course of our time together for this fun intervention, I'm going to be focusing on a different one of these letters each week so that by the end of the fun intervention, you'll be able to really put each of them into practice for yourself. So today we're going to talk about the whoa, first one on that list, which is making space, dropping it on the floor, making space for fun. The reason you need to make space for fun is that we are all so overwhelmed right now. We were overwhelmed before the pandemic. We were overwhelmed just in our regular lives and it's worse now, I'm gonna guess for most people, if not everyone on this call. And a lot of people, as a result, will respond to the idea of having more fun with hostility. It's like, you know, basically screw you. <laughs> like, I'm already too overwhelmed. How can I possibly, possibly put this on my to-do list? So I first want to say we don't want to have a to-do list. If you start to feel like any of this is work, then back off, back off. If fun feels like a to-do, then give it a give it a rest, experiment with something different. We wanna have, as I said before, a playful spirit coming into this and play around with things to give ourselves the gift of fun. It should feel like a little bit of self-indulgence to have permission to play around with having more fun for yourself. And on that note, that is the first step, which is to give yourself permission. I mean, you might actually want, if you're inspired by these slides, guys, you could actually write yourself a physical permission slip for fun, or you can do it mentally. But the reason you need to do that is because, well, there's a couple of reasons. First, we just are not very good at enjoying our own lives. For some reason, we often think that we don't deserve to enjoy our, our own lives. So if you have anything that feels self-indulgent, you kind of feel guilty about it. And I can see why if you were totally shirking all of your responsibilities and just like lounging in a bubble bath 
all day drinking champagne and eating chocolate, like maybe that wouldn't be the best thing. But in reality, I think we should be allowing ourselves to enjoy our limited time on earth. And there's, <laughs> to get ex warning, existential warning, I was actually looking over the weekend at um, an excerpt from a book called The Top Five Regrets from the Dying, written by a palliative care worker. And it's really moving because she's got five of these top regrets that people have. One is, I regret that I worked so hard. And then another one is, I, I regret not having let myself be happy. And for me, at least, that was really powerful. It's like... I, I can understand that. Like what I would regret not, in, not letting myself be happy. And I think that that is actually part of the motivation behind my work is to try to give myself that permission and then also to help others do the same. So sometimes it actually can be helpful to really think I am giving myself permission for this. It is okay. I also think of one of the main blocks that people have when they try to give themselves permission for fun is that they think that you cannot be a serious person and also have fun. So people will say things like, I can't possibly give myself permission to have fun because of climate change, because of gun violence, because of the pandemic, because of political polarization, whatever it may be, there's a lot of really serious issues out there that legitimately deserve our attention. I think it's really interesting though, to reflect on the idea that for some reason we've decided that our time and attention, that, that it's zero sum, that we can't be someone who cares about these things, who takes action to make the world a better place and also have fun. Those don't conflict at all. In fact, if you do give yourself permission to have more fun, you will actually feel more energized to help solve some of those problems. The same experience I described in my guitar class is that when I have fun, I'm given this boost of energy that certainly makes me a better parent. I mean, much better parent and a better partner and spouse. Like I, I just am more able to give of myself because my own tank has been filled. And I think the other thing that we fail to recognize in that regard about fun is that it's not like having fun and then solving the world's problems are totally separate categories. If you can have fun with other people, you'll actually be able to work together to solve problems together because you'll be connecting with each other on a human level. It's actually amazing. Like if you have a huge political difference with someone, but you're having fun together in the moment when you're having fun, those differences are not what you're focusing on. Once you laugh and you smile and you have fun with someone, it becomes a lot easier to relate as human beings. And solving any of these problems requires us to relate to each other as human beings. There are some great examples in a book called Humor Seriously, which I highly recommend in terms of political examples of this, um, just to give one, <laughs> they have a great story about Madeleine Albright when she was Secretary of State doing a, um, a conference in Asia where she was supposed to be negotiating with her Russian counterpart about a very tense situation involving Myanmar. And she also found out that she was supposed to do a skit at this conference. This was like part of the conference was you world leaders, they were supposed to do skits. Okay, right? That's a little strange. So I think she was a little thrown off. But long story short, somehow... Instead of doing something on her own, she ends up doing a skit with the Russian guy. They stay up late one night, the Russians provide the vodka, and they end up rewriting the words to the West Side Story song, I just met Maria, I just met a girl named Maria, to I just made a girl named Madeline, and they call it East West Story. And, <laughs> and in the middle of this dinner, they burst into song and the two of them sing together. Now you might be like, that's ridiculous. Like, what the hell are they doing? Like they're being paid by taxpayers, or at least she was, to go sing a song about West Side Story with your like adversary. But in fact, what she said is that that meant that when they went to the negotiating table, they saw each other as human beings. Like they were actually able to connect on a level that would not have happened if they had not done this what might superficially have seemed like a ridiculous thing, but they had fun together. And so they were able then to have a more productive discussion. In the same book, Humor Seriously, they have some great examples from George W. Bush's cabinet too, about ways that that team used jokes to become closer with each other and make each other feel comfortable. So regardless of what your political affiliation is, there's lots of examples of actually how something that might seem silly at first can be a tool that can be used in the most serious situations of trying to solve some of these international problems. So give yourself a permission slip, people. It's okay. All right. And then I wanted to give you some specific techniques tied to this week's theme about how you can make space for fun in your own life. 
again, I really want to emphasize that everything I'm giving to you is a suggestion for you to play around with and experiment with. It's not like a list of assignments that you have to do. Some people are going to be more interested in making space in some other particular ways and other people might prefer different ways. That's fine. But I just want you to kind of let these ideas float around in your mind and see what piques your curiosity that you might want to try. So we talked about reducing fake fun, but that is a big one. Um, it says reducing fake, there we go. That is a big one. To just make a point, just put it in the back of your mind that for the next couple of days, you're gonna kind of do a audit of yourself as you're going about your daily activities and notice what you're doing with your leisure time and whether or not it actually makes you feel good. And then you can go to the next level and say, does it produce playful connected flow? But honestly, the first thing is just like, is this actually enjoyable? Because you might note or end up noticing that a lot of what you're doing in your leisure time actually isn't enjoyable. And what a gift that is, because once you notice that, it becomes a lot easier to get rid of it. Because if you think about it, anything you do with your leisure time is by definition voluntary, so you don't have to do it. So that's your first step. The next is to break up with your phone. <laughs> Now, obviously, I read a whole book about this, so probably the best way to do that is to look at that book or in The Power of Fun, I do have a lot of concrete suggestions there, but I wanted to give you a couple of um, specific ones that you can do. One, well, sorry, to back up, the reason this is important, why is it important? Because you cannot have fun if you're not in flow for reasons we discussed before. Flow, as we also discussed, is a state of total engagement. If you are at all distracted, you cannot be in flow. That means you cannot have fun if you're constantly being distracted. Do you see what I'm saying here? Like interruptions disrupt flow. Flow is integral to fun. Disruptions can't have fun or distractions. What's the number one source of distractions for most of us these days? The dings from our devices. They're huge distraction machines. So I suggest that you start by creating some better boundaries so that you're not constantly having your time and attention taken from you and you're not constantly being sucked out of flow because that is honestly, the number one reason that people are not having fun is that we're constant, and also why we're miserable is we're constantly being interrupted all the time. So it suggests that one thing you do perhaps today is to take about 10 minutes and make adjustments to the notification settings on your phone and your computer and your other devices so, so that you only receive the ones that you want to receive. I've actually decided to stop calling them notifications and to start calling them interruptions and just suggest that you adjust your interruption settings because that's what it actually is. Like they gave us the word notifications to make it suggest that it's always something important, but in reality, they're just interruptions. So some interruptions are going to be worth your attention and most of them are not. So take some time to make those adjustments. I also highly suggest that you protect your time before bed and right when you wake up. Because if you think about it, if you could do that, you'd probably be giving yourself 12 hours of time between when you're sleeping. Very important. Actually, a lot of people aren't having fun because they're too tired. True story. Um, but also the time before you go to bed and the time right when you wake up, because that's how you're bookending your day. It's going to determine how you sleep and how you feel right before you go to bed. And then the moment when you wake up is going to have an imp impact on the whole trajectory of your day. If you can protect that, you're going to go a long way towards giving yourself more sanity and ability to have fun and just enjoy your life. How do you do that? Well, I would suggest creating a charging station for your phone that's not in your bedroom. Because most of us have our phones on our bedside tables and they're always interrupting us, sometimes even while we sleep. It's important to say, like, if you're worried about how that's going to work for you, just try it for a night. And if you run into problems, you'll figure it out. If you're like, I actually need to be notified by this, you know, or alerted, interrupted by this particular person, you can adjust your settings. You'll work around it. Just play around with this. But one thing I do recommend is get yourself a standalone alarm clock because most people use your phone, use the phone as an alarm clock. If you actually think about it, how do you get an alarm clock to be quiet? You touch it. If your phone's your alarm clock, you're guaranteeing your phone is the first thing you touch in the morning. And therefore you're guaranteeing you're gonna get hijacked by whatever's on your screen. So I would highly suggest getting yourself an alarm clock. And then also I wanted to note that it's really important to give yourself alternatives because if you don't have an alternative easily at the ready, you're gonna be relying on your willpower to prevent yourself from reaching for that phone right before you go to bed. And willpower is a horrible way to change a habit because it's finite. It'll wear out at some point, you'll run out, you'll go right back to your old habit. The phone will end up back on your bedside table. You'll think, huh, I failed at that. 
and you'll get into a self-criticism spiral and then you'll just not want to try it again. We don't want that. So instead, thinks of something right now, maybe even drop it into the chat of something you might be, you'd like to do before bed. I'm not saying like full on playful connected flow. Well, I don't know, maybe you'll be able to do that, but <laughs> we don't need to have full true fun, but just something enjoyable, something that's like relaxing or that you want to do, but supposedly you can't like read a favorite book, right? Write in your journal, do a craft project. Um, I'd be okay with you talking with a friend on the phone and then getting the phone to the bedroom, but something that's actually like a nice use of your time before bed. Because one of the most beautiful things about fun too, and this is a slight digression, but a lot of times when people try to reduce their screen time, they're coming at it from a, a place of the willpower. But it's a lot easier to reduce screen time if you've got something you'd rather do instead. And what I personally found for myself is that fun can be that answer. If I've got lots of ways to tap into a bit of playful connected flow, I don't even wanna be on the phone because it's lame. <laughs> Unless I'm talking to a friend on it, pretty much anything on my phone is lame compared to actually having fun. So you can start to have your screen life balance shift naturally. So then the, the, um, the last suggestion I wanted to give in terms of making space this week, although again, there's a ton more in the book, but I am uh, I'm really bad at brevity. So I'm really trying to limit myself is appropriately, I did not even set that up this way, but limit your list. <laughs> that is actually what I have on this paper. I limited my own list here. That's an expression I got actually from my publisher. And the idea is that we all have these endless to-do lists, stuff we actually have to do, but there's often some superfluous stuff in there that's not actually that urgent or that isn't actually necessary. So I think it's really helpful to actually look at your list, either your literal to-do list that you write down or the one that you have going on in your mind and ask yourself, is this enjoyable? Is it essential? If it's not enjoyable, but, it, and it's not an essential, what am I saying? If it's essential, got to keep it, right? If it's truly enjoyable, you should keep it because again, we're enjoying our lives. But if it's not enjoyable and it's not essential, get rid of it, say no to it, just clear that <laughs> off your list. And I think it's interesting to think about some of the um, items that might not immediately, like some might be obvious, but there's other things that's like, like, I don't know about you, but my brain is constantly coming up with ideas. It'll be like, hey, Catherine, why don't you start I don't know, a walking tour app of Philadelphia based on the songs from Hamilton in which you connect the songs from Hamilton to the historical sites in which those events took place. That's a real example. I didn't say no to that for better or for worse, but like my brain is coming up with ideas like that all the time that might actually sound enjoyable, but are not actually essential. And I'm really struggling myself and like working on knowing what to say yes or no to. But it's the same thing if you're invited to a social engagement that if you really think about it, you're like, that doesn't sound fun at all. And I don't actually have to do it. Experiment with saying no, it's okay. So take from that what you will. Um, I wanna wrap this up and then I will save a few mm -hmm. minutes if people do wanna stick around for questions. But what I wanted to mm -hmm. say is that, well, a couple things. Again, I'm really happy you're here. I'm very excited for the fun intervention on a personal note. And, I, and in terms of what you guys should do between now and our next call, please continue to notice delights. We're going to talk more about that in detail later on in the fun intervention, but I hope you've getting, gotten a taste of how enjoyable and delightful it can be to share them with other people. So I encourage you to invite people from your own lives to start a delight, delight practice with you. It's a use of technology I think is actually wonderful. So you can actually you know, text people delights. I have a bunch of delight text chains going on myself and it's just, it's delightful. So keep doing that. On that same note, if you know other people who might want to join this fun intervention, please share with them the link. Christy can probably drop in um, the link to, to sign up, but it's basically just how to have fun.com and they'll be able to find the fun intervention sign up. Totally fine if it's after February 1st, because they'll be able to join on a rolling basis. But I think the more of us doing it, the more fun it's going to be. Um, I also wanted to make sure that if you're interested, you sign out the, sorry, you fill out the intention setting survey that I shared in the email. Um, I think Christy can probably share that as well, but that is basically to help you figure out why you're doing this to begin with. And then also to help me gather more information and data about what the impact is of the fund prevention and demographic information about who is trying these ideas so that I can start to attempt to contribute to the research on fun. Cause believe it or not, they're really, there's basically none. So, oh my goodness, we're in this like vanguard of uh, <laughs> scientific research. And the last thing I wanted to say is that I've got an amazing lineup of guests for live calls coming up throughout this fun intervention. 
I've gotten one expert a week to come and do a talk with us. So this week on Thursday, and I, this is the only week that is two between me and this, is Eve Rodsky, who wrote these two books, Fair Play and Unicorn Space, Find Your Unicorn Space, both of which are amazing and I recommend. And I'm going to talk with her about how you actually reduce resentment, particularly in a relationship setting, and carve out time for yourself to have what she refers to as your unicorn space, which is very um, aligned with fun. Then next week, I'm going to have oops, a call with Tom Vanderbilt, who wrote this book, Beginners, The Art and, I'm sorry, The Joy and Transformative Power of Lifelong Learning, about how and why we should try new things and pursue passions, even as grownups. And this book is just lovely because basically it was inspired by his realization that he kept watching his kid have fun, but he actually wasn't learning any of the things that she was doing. So he ends up embarking on this adventure where he learns among other things, or he tries how to surf, um, how to play chess. He joins a choir and he takes drawing lessons. And then he learns how to make jewelry because he ends up dropping his wedding ring into the ocean when he is surfing. But i um, very excited to talk to him about how we can allow ourselves to be beginners at things as grownups and why it's so important. Um, I've got a rebel, it's actually my favorite week, but guests to be determined. I have some exciting uh, prospects there. And then lastly, Keep At It is going to be with Alex Sujung Kim Pang, who wrote this book, Rest, um, Why You Get More Done When You Work Less. And I want to talk with him. I actually quote him in my book. I quote all these people in my book about how to um, maintain this going forward. And then I forgot to say a special Valentine's Day guest on the 14th is for the week of attracting fun. And that was totally coincidental. But Lori Santos, who is the host of the Happiness Lab podcast and just a very fun, wonderful person whom I become friends with over the course of these various books. And I coached Lori through a fun intervention for her podcast, which if you haven't listened to it, they did a wonderful job. Um, but now the tables are turned and I get to actually ask Lori questions about attracting fun and some of the things she's gleaned from her own fun intervention and from her huge body of research that she is uh, an expert in about happiness. So I hope that you'll join some of those. There's a registration link for all of those in my emails. Um, so that is it today. It is almost 1245, which is the end of the official call. If you'd like to stick around, I'm happy to answer some of these questions uh, for the next couple of minutes. So if you're heading out, it was great to have you here. I hope this was useful. Um, and if you'd like to stick around, you're welcome to. And if you have any questions that you'd like to send just in general, funtervention at screenlifebalance.com, you can send them to us there. For some reason, I cannot find the questions that you guys sent for this webinar, which is killing me. But, oh, fuck. Am I still here, guys? Okay, my, what, my freaking Zoom just kicked me out. Okay, anyway, well, that, I guess that was a good. <laughs> oh God, I'm such an expert at Zoom. All right, so that was that. I was gonna say, Zoom didn't give me any of your questions. So um, send them to Vuntervention at screenlightbalance.com and I'm gonna look at some of these questions right now. And now you're really gonna see Catherine in action as I try to uh, do this. All right. All right, how do you manage to have fun without having guilt about enjoying yourself? I hope that, that I did answer that question through the, through the call. Um, Barbara Fredrickson's theory was, it's uh, the broaden and build theory of positive emotion, which is basically that positive experiences don't just feel good in the moment, they actually help us to have more resilience for moments of future stress. Um, will the web weekly webinars be recorded? Yes, they will be, and it will make them accessible to you. Um, will we be able to share this recording? Yes, you can. How are play and fun intertwined? Hopefully I got into that with the playfulness being an intrinsic part of it, but really it's about not allowing perfectionism to get in the way of you being your authentic self and having a playful spirit. And it can take the literal form of play or just be the attitude that you bring to things. Um, how about using your phone to play fun games? You know, I think that that is up to the individual person. I think it's all about just intention and about self-awareness. So if you ask yourself, you're playing a game on your phone and say, I'm actually enjoying this. And you say, oh, I am, I am enjoying it. Whether you're just enjoying it or you're actually full on having playful connected flow, both are fine. So, right. So as long as you ask yourself that, then keep doing it. The point is just to become more aware of how we're spending our time. Um, let's see. Okay. Can I repeat what SPARK stands for? Yes. 
make space, pursue passions, attract fun, rebel, and keep at it. But I will go, I will go into more detail about that. Um, let's see if there's anything else in here. Will we have a, so a Facebook group or some other non-social media where we can connect with others? I'm not sure. I mean, it's actually been really cool to see you guys interact with each other through the chat. It's always like this moment of fear where they think, oh God, there's gonna be some jerk who's gonna come in here and start Zoom bombing people. But I wasn't able to look at this as I was in flow talking to you guys, but I don't think anyone did that. So it actually be pretty cool to give you a way to interact with each other. So if that's something that's of interest, um, I can try to make that happen. All right. Let's see. Okay, I think that's most of the ones that I'm able to really answer right now, unless uh, Christy, you see anything right? Okay, let me just get one. Some forms of fun require energy to start even if they end up being better afterwards. For example, reading the news after a long day versus doing yoga, which I actually enjoy. It takes more energy to start. Any tips? That is definitely a issue is that it can take a bit of initiative to do the things that you know you'll end up enjoying. And it's so hard when we already come into our evenings and our leisure time feeling exhausted. That's one of the main reasons we just end up flipping on Netflix instead of doing something we know that would truly be more nourishing to us. So I think the important thing there is to have that self-awareness that you just expressed by asking that question, which is that you know you're going to feel better. So just that itself can be motivating. I feel that myself all the time if it's the evening and I'm like, okay, I could either just like sit here. And in my case, it's often stare at my email inbox, which is never fun. <laughs> it's like a horrible example of leisure time or practice the guitar. And it's like, oh, I got to go practice the guitar. Well, one technique I found is that I should leave it out of its case because the easier I can make it, the more likely I am to do it. So one suggestion I would have to have to get over that inertia is to leave your yoga mat out or to leave a prop out so that it's as easy as possible. Because just the act of unzipping the case and getting the guitar out is often enough to get me to feel like that is a total, total burden. But if it's out there and just staring me at the face, I'm like, I could just pick it up. Like I can do that. So I would suggest being aware of the feeling you'll get afterwards and then making it easy. Um, all right, I don't wanna keep you guys too long, uh, but feel free to send questions again to funtervention at screenlifebalance.com. And I hope I'll see a bunch of you in the future calls. And really thank you again for sharing some of your Monday afternoon or evening or morning, depending on your location with me. Uh, and I hope that you enjoyed it. I definitely had fun. All right. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>